We're going to have one more uh, patient perspective, and that's a, a lead into a, a brief discussion um, that I'm going to provide on, on therapies on the horizon. Um, see Michael and Emma coming towards the front here. So uh, part of the, the way that I phrased this question as to when, when you saw a response is that the, the dosing um, for the really the only drug that's available right now for um, HUS, it, it, uh, it's not given very often. It's not, BI, it's not twice a day dosing. It's not once a day dosing, not once every other day dosing. Um, and so as uh, uh, physicians inside the hospital, um, we are sometimes uh, uh, dealing with patients that are making no urine, you know, and uh, when someone doesn't make any urine for six hours, you know, we're we're really concerned. So when we give a drug, we want to see urine in an hour. <laughs> that's that's not happening. Um, so just your perspectives as to when you started noticing a response um, after you were treated. I'll start off. Yeah, because I don't have access to echolizumab yet. All right. So. All right. Important. Um, the only time in the last 15 years I've actually felt well was a, a three-year period between the time of my second episode in 2003 and the failed transplant in 2006. Um, of course, I'm living with all the restrictions of dialysis five times a week, but I was unable to work and felt felt well most of the time at that time. The Michael, did you, did you notice any response with plasmapheresis? Uh, yes, because I was in a state where I was almost dying <laughs> yeah. when I initially presented. So uh, it got me back to, to health where I was able to go back to work. So meaning to say you, you, you noticed uh, a change in the sense of strength or decreased fatigue? Um, yeah, I would say so. Okay. Yeah. It was a very slow process. Got it. Because it, it took th um, six weeks at least, and maybe more, to yeah. wean me off of plasma exchange. Yeah, so um, the only treatment for AHS I've had so far is plasma, the so-called treatment, which is really not a proper treatment now anymore for um, AHS. It might have saved my life, but it did not save my kidneys, nor did it make me feel really well. In fact, plasma exchange has been a terrible experience for me physically, as it's very hard on my body. I needed to have rides to the hospital as driving was impossible due to the irritation it produced and the uh, fatigue. I regularly had allergic reactions to the plasma I received despite the Benadryl administered before treatment. Since I started dialysis after AHS destroyed my transplant, I have not had any major AHS episode again. However, with, without the proper treatment of eculizumab, there have been many secondary issues which have uh, taken my health away from me. In addition, my family has noticed my health deteriorate on a year-to-year -year basis in a noticeable way. My afternoon naps that I take, they're taking longer and longer. I have less and less stamina for going out for walks and going on outings, and I can't stay out as late for social events, and so, et cetera. Uh, acquaintances who ask how I'm doing have often joked and replied to my response that they also don't have stamina they used to have, but uh, age-related deterioration is not what I'm describing here. Misunderstanding is a regular part of what we live with, with uh, since AHS is so rare and often invisible. Uh, it leads to isolation in social circles for both the patient and their family. Peers, friends, and family do not see me much when I am not well. So they make judgments on my health based on what they see when I do feel well. This is not a good representation of my, my overall health, so it leads to all kinds of misunderstandings. Thanks, Michael. I, uh, I was uh, not very well at all for the first two years when I was on CAPD. I never really uh, like thrived with that treatment. Um, once my living donor transplant had failed, that was the moment when I decided that I was going to go on to uh, home hemodialysis and get the best treatment for dial uh, as dialysis as I could. Um, and I think there was a, a, a good time there when I was settled on that type of dialysis. and. Um, 
Uh, my mum recalls seeing me walking down the road and said that I'd got my walk back, sort of meaning that I was confident and looked like I had strength, whereas I'd looked frail and, and was scared to do anything, really, uh, suffering really badly with anxiety and things. Um, uh, I think that I, I, I did quite well for, for many years there, and, and I, I socially I did start to go out more, and, um, and I did, did quite well on the dialysis. Um, but I always identified myself as a sick person. I had a chronic illness and I thought about my health a lot more. Um, it took my uh, successful uh, transplantation four years ago um, to really feel well and, and to stop thinking of myself in terms of, uh, of a sick person. Um, and quite often I do just completely forget. I can almost forget to have my eculizumab, which I have fortnightly. Um, because I, I'm so well and getting on with life. Um, so I think, yeah, probably it, it's the transplant. But I think uh, with anyone, any, uh, anyone who's had renal failure and the journey that renal failure takes you on is, is a roller coaster. It's up and down. And, and um, I could still have things today sort of linked to the, the dialysis that might trigger and, and cause me problems. But on the whole, I think I'm feel well and I don't identify as someone who's sick anymore. Emma, the, the, the progress or the resolution of your symptoms, what, was it at times slow enough where you, you forgot that uh, things were actually changing for the better? Or could you notice a distinct uh, point in time where you, f you felt better uh, and, and you were worse prior to that? I think from the, for the transplant, it was six months. I, yeah. I, everything just came back and I felt like myself, but better. Um, after six months for the, for the successful transplant. Um, and it probably <coughs> took about about a year or so after the failed transplant when I got that, well, probably about two years, to get myself really settled on home dialysis. Um, and that was when I, I yeah. felt like, yeah. As a physician, it's somewhat difficult uh, when we're taking histories, especially when patients are seen as for a second opinion. Um, and the events have taken place over the last year and a half uh, for them to identify when they started feeling better or when they started feeling worse, it's really difficult to pinpoint sometimes just because of the, the slow progress and improvement or, or decline. I think as a patient, you just have a moment where you, where you realize like you're doing something that, you, that you'd struggle to do and you think, oh, I'm not struggling anymore. I can just yeah. stand up from, you know, from like crouching down or something like that. And it, it, yeah, I think, but obviously for my mom, when she saw me, I didn't know she was like driving the car behind. She saw me walking. It was really, really obviously clear to her that that was, I was, you know, better. I got yeah. more walk back. Yeah, got it. Like I used to have. Probably have a walk. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, mine was, uh, I, I can remember being in ICU and remember just like being so ready to just go to sleep. And the doctor's saying, no, you can't go to sleep. You have to stay awake for this. I'm sorry, but you have to pay attention. You have to understand what's going on. Um, and then as soon as I got out of the hospital, I was just ready to go. I, I wanted to be normal again. I, I could not comprehend this new normal that everyone was talking about. Well, you can't, you can't do this or you can't do that. And you have to be careful here and you have to do this. And it was just like this restriction that everybody put on me. And then once I was like, you know, anything that I do is going to be a risk to some extent. So, I mean, yes, I can be careful, but I'm going to do what I, I want to do right now because this is what is my normal. So um, that at that point was um, being a nanny and being around kids. Um, I know that was like probably the worst idea ever. Kids are like walking germs. Right. And I did get sick a lot and it did take me a lot longer to get better. But after that, it was just, okay, I'm ready to do it again. Let's go. And I, I was just more ready to get right back into it and right back on the horse from the get go. Yeah. From the time that uh, you came out of the ICU um, to the time you felt better, how, how long was that period? Three or four days. Really? Yeah. I was like ready to go. I did not want to be sick. I did not want this new normal that everyone was talking about. I wanted my life back and I wanted to go from there. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't even want to think about this. I knew the basics <clears throat> and I knew what I needed to watch out for, but that was all that I wanted to know about it. I went through a period of denial where like I don't actually have it because I don't feel like I have it. 
Um, and then it was a period of, okay, I do have this, I do still need to get treatment. Um, and I just, I kept going from there and there, just one step sure. in front of the other. Sure, the, uh, in asking these kinds of questions to other patients as well, it seems those people that are diagnosed more recently, 2015, 16, 17, um, compared to those that have had the disease for a longer period of time, um, the time from treatment to accelerated uh, return of function and uh, resolution of symptoms is much shorter. So this, this seems like uh, yeah. certainly, what, unfortunately, what we see in, um, uh, in the clinic uh, when it comes to the, the heritage of AHOS and kind of um, pre and, and post um, availability of, of drug. So um, the, the talk that I'm going to give is uh, really formulated in um, from discussions that I've had with a uh, number of the folks in the HUS Alliance. And the, uh, the mandate here really was to um, try to focus on new therapies that, that are available. Um, and what I'm going to give you is somewhat um, a toolbox, and this is for primarily our, our very educated patients, um, to guide you through uh, potential uh, resources as well as locations where you can find more information about how to, how to treat your disease. And so these are really going to be uh, um, modes of finding experimental therapy uh, aside from what's available um, already through FDA-approved means. So um, th this is my financial disclosure. I actually build on this in, in part in the sense that um, um, I have become involved with uh, FDA dialogue in, in various forms. Um, I uh, work with Alexian as it relates with the uh, um, FDA mandated phase four uh, safety analysis of ecolizumab, and we've been doing that since about 2012. Uh, I also do some work with an entirely uh, separate pharmaceutical company. This is related with um, contrast agents as well as um, iron deficiency anemia, but um, have gone through the FDA process when it comes to uh, generating the appropriate documentation to um, bring that drug uh, potentially to the point of, uh, and, and again, this drug related with AMAG pharmaceuticals, to the point of uh, repurposed use. And so I'll, I'll tell you my experience in that regard. And the Brigham and Women's Hospital certainly um, uh, has been um, a resource for me when it comes to dealing with what we call the Institutional Review Board. So I'll, I'll mention um, uh, each of those uh, components uh, in the next few slides. So again, this is feedback that I received um, from patients and patient advocates, uh, and that is, um, first of all, um, offer, offer therapy if it's not available. Um, and in some parts of the world, as, as we recognize, and even across our border, uh, the United States border, um, some, some therapy is not available. But when it is available, uh, can we do more to make the therapy more efficacious can we get a faster response time, response time, and can we reduce the side effects associated with current medications? Those are really um, the, the key components that I gleaned from conversations um, speaking with, uh, with folks at the AHUS Alliance. And again, the example is ecolizumab. I mean, th this is a pretty uh, confined discussion in the sense that uh, we're, we're not dealing with heart failure and uh, uh, a variety of, uh, of medications that we could use for that same diagnosis. We've got a single um, approved medication currently. Certainly there are other modes of treating this uh, disease state, but at least when it comes to medications with FDA approval, this is what we're dealing with. And we're trying to refine this process. Certainly it was an entirely different dialogue and perspective in 2011 when the drug first came out. Uh, but this is where we are now, and there's um, certainly uh, different needs that are recognized as of 2017 compared to 2011. So um, again, this is more so uh, to reveal to patients and people outside of uh, kind of the academic institution what goes on in order to finally um, get a drug which is approved by the FDA for a specific use. Um, and recognize that as patients, as part of the general public, you have access to points inside of this overall arc um, of development, of drug development. And specifically at the beginning, that is uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Um, this is supported, this is a website supported by the United States government. Um, and it is required to have your study uh, registered inside of uh, that website in order to initiate um, 
a uh, local application, uh, for instance, um, to submit uh, an initial uh, institutional review board protocol to your local IRB or to the Brigham and Women's Hospital. It's also required if you're going to initiate an investigational new drug application to the FDA. <coughs> Both your IND for short, as well as your IRB protocols have to be somewhat done in parallel, but at the same time, um, the, they have to be initiated with this registration at clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov, again, publicly accessible and very searchable. I'll show you the webpage in a minute, but uh, just recognize that's where everything starts. So there's a lot of revelation that's available to, uh, to the patient in an inter with an internet um, access uh, very early on in the process. But then at the very end, um, there is also uh, identification of um, a drug as well as um, side effect profile, which is uh, accompanying that drug once it is approved by the FDA. So what they call the package insert identifies indications, but it also has a number of uh, descriptions of, of side effect profiles associated with that drug. That's also available out uh, in the public uh, for, you to, for you to review. But recognize everything in between here. Um, the IND application. You as an investigator do not know what other IND applications are out there um, that have been received by the FDA. You can't query those. So you're guessing somewhat um, as to the application that you're submitting. Again, there, there, there is association. So um, the title of your, uh, of your um, investigation is gonna be labeled in clinicaltrials.gov, but actually the IND, once it is submitted, um, it is requested by the FDA to actually have amendments um, included inside of a single IND application. So if your IND is uh, regarding a single topic or a single therapy, there may be amendments that are included inside of that IND that not, do not directly one for one associate with the clinicaltrials.gov uh, identifier. And we've just gone through this uh, when it comes to uh, this contrast agent uh, drug. So um, IRB approval is going to um, be uh, only accepted after an IND has been, um, uh, has been executed and the FDA has, has recommended um, proceeding with the study. So if uh, you are repurposing a drug, um, potentially if, if that patient population is gonna be using that drug for an already FDA approved use, you probably don't need to have the IND, but it's uh, infrequent, very infrequent um, to have a drug which is going to be used for a separate indication um, not requiring uh, an IND, and subsequently the IRB will flag that and require you to get an IND before an IRB submission. So the IRB uh, submission, uh, depending on how detailed uh, your, your application is, um, can take several months. The IND application takes probably three or four months if it's an accelerated process. Um, the IRB is something that as investigators, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, they're gonna approach us uh, in order to uh, involve patient enrollment at, at our individual sites. So we're gonna be dealing with local IRBs. Um, there is the intention uh, when you're using more than a, uh, a single site, uh, and most often when you're, when you're trying to bring a drug to market, you're gonna be dealing with multiple sites to use a, uh, a localized or a uh, central IRB. Um, depending on the healthcare system you're dealing with, um, the either they either uh, like or do not like um, central IRBs. Uh, what we deal with right now, uh, at least our healthcare system, does not like central IRBs. And that is because there is relinquishment, uh, uh, relinquishment of um, the responsibility and potentially some risk associated with patient enrollment uh, when you uh, give uh, your IRB approval off to a centralized rather than a local IRB. Um, you just can't be as specific about um, the specific uh, institution as well as hospital policies involved inside the consent forms if you are not approving those and instead they're going to a central IRB. Um, data is eventually generated <laughs> after a lot of paperwork. Um, if there's enough data uh, which is available, you can then submit this to the, to the FDA. They're looking for your IND initially and then you can submit uh, a new drug application and if that's um, approved, then um, there is an announcement that, um, that this drug is now available for review um, by the public, uh, FDA.gov. But again, recognize that it's really at the very beginning, which could be years, uh, which could be two, three, four years before what is actually registered inside of clinicaltrials.gov uh, comes to fruition uh, as, uh, as an approved drug. 
So this takes time and to be able to monitor uh, the process closely is very difficult when there's so many steps in between which, uh, which are not public knowledge. So um, I, again, I think many of you are, are familiar with clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, this is an interesting website in the way that they uh, at least announce this in the sense that uh, they state that there are a number of other sites um, uh, there are a number of other sites that are, are not U.S. based. Again, that feasibly, that, that, that's the case, but at the same time recognize that this is a required website for U.S. Um, United States um, FDA approval. And so this is going to be used specifically for that purpose. If you happen to find other studies that are there um, that are not U.S. based, that, that's great. But um, most of what you're going to see here is going to be uh, submitted and listed um, in a database format as a result of the requirement to move through the, uh, the US FDA approval process. <clears throat> this is what um, you can do at, at the web page. Uh, you can simply search um, by topic. And so if you put in AHUS, you don't even put in atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, just AHUS. Uh, this is what, what shows up. And um, I know it's very small to read, but at the same time, just recognize that there aren't a lot of studies that are out there related with, a with AHUS. If you expand your search, thrombotic microangiopathy, you actually get a lot of terms. Um, and as a result, since 2012, um, there, there's still uh, multiple um, studies that are out there. Um, not all of them are associated with treatment uh, of thrombotic microangiopathy. Some of these are studies that are simply related to evaluation of, or they um, somehow got a keyword term to associate their study with thrombotic microangiopathy. So you have to be careful as to what the actual disease state is that they're treating. So uh, this is uh, from a review. Data here is probably uh, a year old or so. Um, and uh, recognize that uh, what is on clinicaltrials.gov is uh, changing on a daily basis. Um, and so this is somewhat um, a compendium that um, uh, myself and, uh, and Jean Francis um, put together when it comes to uh, identifying potential drugs that could be associated with complement activation. And so what it uh, really entails is a number of drugs that are out there um, that could be associated with antibody binding and noting that uh, antibodies can bind complement and initiate the complement uh, cascade. Uh, certainly, there, there are other uh, medications that are simply here as a result uh, of their association with uh, disease states, so uh, PNAH. Um, I, I just updated this slide to include um, ALNCC5 uh, also for the indication of PNAH. This was a recent addition to clinicaltrials.gov. They just updated um, their status in June of 2017. So again, very difficult to keep tabs on everything, but uh, at the same time, uh, it's, uh, it's an active site that has some, some good information. When it comes to um, uh, those drugs that are out there that actually have the, uh, an indication in their clinicaltrials.gov identifier as uh, for treatment of AHUS, again, not, not a lot out there. Ecolizumab and... Uh, so, uh, where are we? There was one more. Um, so, OMS721 um, overlaps with thrombotic microangiopathy. HUS? No. TMA? Yes. What's the difference? This is, uh, it's, in, it's in development. Um, I, I really don't think um, we're going to be continuing to see um, drugs uh, being used explicitly for the purpose of HUS. Um, but at the same time, whether or not they have effect for that diagnosis uh, remains a, a real question and, and what we need to um, consider when we're looking at the outcomes of those studies. So um, the cascade in, in yet another format, um, the drugs that are, are currently uh, being focused for potentially uh, treating patients with AHUS uh, include uh, not only uh, the alternate uh, uh, the classical or alternative pathways, but also the, the lectin pathway. So this is a uh, uh, Manin, um, uh, 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 mannose lectin binding associated serum protease, protease which potentially um, could have effect on, on the classical cas or on the alternative pathway. Uh, we're also talking about different modes of inhibiting C5, not only as an antibody, but potentially using um, uh, small inhibitory RNA, and then also uh, receptor inhibition of uh, the C5A receptor and whether or not that could have an effect. Um, 
again, each of these points in, inside of the, uh, the sequence um, of uh, complement cascade activation has a different effect. I, I remember a uh, really pointed uh, conversation with Dr. Uh, uh, David Salant maybe a year ago or so, and he, and he was talking about uh, his experience with uh, Compstatin, um, a drug to inhibit C3 directly, and the profound effect that it had on, on patients when it comes to causing um, uh, uh, immune suppression. And, and so at, at each point inside of this cascade, uh, the effect on the drug you would think could be anticipated, but actually um, there, there are caveats that r really are not recognized until um, the drug actually, actually goes to trial. So I, I, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a board certified physician in the United States. So uh, it, it's just, uh, it has to be uh, stated as such because uh, there's a lot that's going on outside of the United States, but I'll tell you, it, it takes a lot to figure out what's going on inside your country alone. So um, I, I am no expert when it comes to uh, dialoguing with the FDA, but at the same time, they are talking to me, so I, I have some experience there. When it comes to um, those trials that are available in Europe, um, I, my sense is, speaking with, with patients uh, that are dealing with AHUS, they're, they're really interested in if they don't have medication, getting medication. And where it comes from um, is yet another question. Um, because of the interactions that I've had, that certainly there are overlaps between um, the approval process in the United States instead of, instead of Europe. Um, I, I am not experienced at all with uh, the, the Canadian um, uh, approval process, but I think Michael has really uh, given a, uh, um, a perspective that I did not have prior to today when it comes to uh, the stringencies associated with drug approval and, uh, and what's required inside of Canada. But recognize they also have a database which is available which, which you can peruse. Um, and very likely there are other databases that are out there um, in Southeast Asia and in India and Africa, but I have not looked at those at all just because uh, of the expanse uh, when it comes to trying to understand what's required inside of uh, the United States environment as well as the collective European environment. Yeah, sure, Michael. Um, the exodusma has been approved by Health Canada. Uh, is Michael's uh, mic on? If it, if, okay. Oh, now it's on. Good. Um, back in 2013, Eculizumab was approved by Health Canada for sale uh, based on its efficacy and, um, and safety. So uh, the, the issue in Canada is that we have 10 different provinces, uh, three different territories, and each one, each one of those provinces manages their own health care budget. Um, I think only 20% of the health care budget comes from the federal government. So really it's up to the provinces to make decisions on drugs that are funded. And that's been our biggest problem. We're like 10 different countries within one. And um, so we have to fight 10 different provinces to be able to get them to agree to fund this drug. Uh, obviously it's because of the expense. Yeah. So that's been our issue all along. Sure. Um, it's a really fragmented system, and each one is politically mo and um, motivated based on the, the cost of the, of the therapy. Right. I mean, so. and, I mean, I think we're all recognizing that the timeline for approval of a drug is certainly uh, much different from uh, what is expected from a patient who is sick and trying to get access to that drug. I remember when we gave our first dose of eglizumab back in 2009 is to a patient that was having antibody-mediated rejection, and we had to write a letter to the president of the hospital in order to get a, a dose of 600 milligrams. Yeah. So it, it much different now, but again, that's you know almost 10 years now um, since we've had to deal with, with those kinds of uh, difficulties. And mm -hmm. it's still not easy to get drug um, currently inside of the United States, but certainly um, not the experience that you're having in Canada. We're hoping to change that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so again, just culling from databases that are available to, uh, to you, uh, the public, uh, when it comes to reviewing what, what is out there and, and, uh, and the indications for drug. So um, first of all, I is there a drug available? Um, and, and if there is a drug available, then um, how do you get access to it? That's what we're talking about here. Um, the next point is, all right, uh, and, and we're really talking about access as it, re as it relates with uh, financial burden. I mean, that's the restriction here is just because of the cost associated there. Um, 
when we deal with, uh, that is myself as a transplant nephrologist at the Bergman Women's Hospital, uh, deal with um, clinical studies and uh, we're trying to enroll patients, one of the first things that we're going to actually uh, state when it comes to uh, identifying patients for enrollment um, is that there is no drug cost. And that is uh, the essence of an experimental trial is that you are assuming a risk as a patient going into trial. Uh, there are certainly studies that are out there in phase one and two when it comes to identifying uh, safety associated with this drug. Uh, but when you are receiving it, there is still a potential of being an experimental drug to have an unknown adverse effect. Um, but that is balanced by the fact that it is not uh, costing you um, any, any value when it comes to uh, the actual reimbursement of insurance companies, et cetera. So recognize that uh, OMS 721, uh, one of these MASP um, medications or MSP uh, inhibitors does have an indication for thrombotic microangiopathy. There's a presence inside the United States. There's also a presence uh, in the EU. And so these are out there. Uh, they're there for you to, to, to further review. And, and it's certainly something that uh, should be brought up to the physician that you're caring for to identify whether or not this is, uh, this is the study for you. Um, recognize that the really the only other drug out there that would fit inside of our current rubric, and again, TMA, AHUS, um, is, uh, for uh, lack of a better term, a, a longer-acting ecolizumab or a second-generation um, ecolizumab. And, uh, and there's a big presence here uh, when it comes to the studies that are out there inside of the United States. Um, and there's, there's five active studies or five studies which are, which are in process inside of the uh, the EU clinical trials uh, database also. Um, so this is something that uh, really I, I think you should, uh, as uh, informed patients, um, review on a regular basis because, as I said, there are updates that happen all the time. And there are times when uh, paperwork finally gets uh, processed. And so there is an, a, new, a new announcement where um, a, uh, a study moves from uh, active not recruiting to recruiting. Um, and that's the, uh, the time point that, that you need to try to, um, try to um, um, initiate a, a further conversation with your physician and, and potentially with, with those um, companies that are offering those experimental drugs. Um, so what uh, I list here also, again, uh, these would be interesting medications to use if, for instance, they were approved and available just because they're out there and they would be used for off-label use. Um, this has come up previously. We had a patient that had, um, um, uh, he had urticarial vasculitis. And uh, so the question was whether or not to use a C1 esterase inhibitor. Um, and the question was further whether or not he had a diagnosis of uh, urticarial vasculitis versus, uh, versus AHUS in the manifestation that he had. So there, there is a drug that is out there um, that, that is available, but you would have to, as a physician, take the responsibility of using it as off-label. Um, in, in these situations, um, these are still under investigation, so it remains difficult to even have those accessible to you because um, recognize that if you are gonna be inside of a clinical trial, they have very strict exclusion and inclusion criteria as to what kind of patient could be uh, associated with, this, with a study. And the reason there is because that data is then gonna be submitted either to uh, an affiliate inside of the European Union or in the US um, or that federal body to state whether or not that data is uh, qualifying for approval. And so because those requirements are so strict, um, the patients that, that need to be included are also selected very, uh, per, uh, very specifically. And as a result, if th there really isn't such thing as off-label use um, of a medication um, if it's inside of still an experimental mode. Uh, now, when it comes to compassionate use, again, there's uh, infrequent cases, very rare cases where those drugs that are not available for um, a specific indication uh, are potentially um, available for compassionate use, but that's really not even a, a topic worth discussing just due to the fact that it happens so infrequently in such a small uh, population of patients. <clears throat> so um, nearly concluding here, um, I, I think oh, it, it needs to be uh, recognized that uh, we're talking about uh, the United States, we're talking about Canada, uh, we're talking about uh, Europe, when it comes to India, China, South America, Southeast Asia, there is hardly a footprint 
when it comes to what we have available as physicians um, to study, analyze, either inside the literature or availability when it comes to, um, to drugs for that um, extremely large population of patients in, in, inside of the world. And uh, there's a video here from um, the, uh, uh, the leader of the HUS um, representation patient advocacy group in India, Kamal Shah, and uh, he talks a little bit about um, his current uh, experience. The biggest problem with my situation is that the only drug that exists currently which can cure me of my disease is eculizumab, which is not available in my country and is very expensive and out of my reach to buy as well. If somehow a way can be figured out by which the drug can be made available to Indians at affordable prices, then it would enable me to live a life free of dialysis. You see the dialysis the machine to the left here. global in favor of rare diseases would enable better awareness, which would lead to early diagnosis, which could possibly prevent people from proceeding to stages in the disease life cycle where treatment may not always be possible. It would try to ensure equitable access to drugs for patients affected by these diseases. Currently, I feel very frustrated that there is a drug that is available out there that can solve most, most of my health problems, but I do not have access to it. Uh, can you go to, uh, Wes, can you go to the summary slide? So th that's a perspective. Kamal's uh, perspective is one that I, I really had a, no more than an inkling um, that existed, say, four months ago. Um, it, it's working with the HUS Alliance and, and their relationships with uh, so many other groups that are outside of the United States um, that has uh, made me aware that uh, there are so many patients in need uh, that don't have access for a variety of reasons, um, often for cost, but uh, people that, that we, I think, really need to recognize that um, uh, we are not providing what, what, uh, what they need, um, and it is, a, it is a huge population of patients. Um, so just in summary, um, I, w again, what I'm trying to give uh, primarily to patients here is a toolbox um, as to how to go about looking for ways uh, to treat your disease. And I think the, the first question you need to um, ask yourself is whether or not um, the therapy that you're pursuing, has it been authorized by a federal uh, governing body? I think it's very important to have regulation, safety profiles available for whatever medications you're gonna be using. But at the same time, um, it is simply the conventional therapy that's out there uh, uh, equal um, or as good an option as uh, the experimental medications that you're, that you're thinking about. Um, resources that are available, again, FDA.gov is probably the easiest place to go. It, it takes some patience because, again, there's a lot of information inside of these sites, but uh, recognize that you can really refine your search um, pretty discreetly when it comes to what you're looking for. When it comes to, for instance, those that are actively recruiting, those um, uh, um, studies that have not yet started recruitment, um, it's probably worthwhile to remove uh, in your search terms those the uh, studies that have been terminated unless you're looking specifically for why a study was terminated um, or those that are no longer actively recruiting and the data has been compiled. It's somewhat nice to know those uh, presets due to the fact that you can look historically as to the experience inside of um, uh, the medication type or the disease type that, uh, that you're studying. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of information out there, and certainly I think it's important for you to get um, the information called in some point, but speak with your physician uh, early about uh, what to do and, and whether or not a, a study is right for you. So um, that's all I, uh, I, I want to tell you about uh, uh, new therapies. Are there any uh, general questions that I could try to answer based on the, the data I provided here? I don't have a question, but just a minor comment to expand on what's been said. And that is that um, the existence of organizations like this that can bring patients together worldwide who could participate in a clinical trial is essential to clinical trials happening, especially true for very, very rare diseases. There are a number of companies that are working on complement mediators 
There are also a number of companies that are working on biosimilars and biobetters um, of Solaris. And these include major companies like Amgen and others, Amgen publicly and many others not publicly. And all of them are asking the question, should I take this very promising drug that inhibits the complement system and could conceivably be valuable in AHUS? Should I trial it in AHUS? Or should I go into other diseases in which there may be more patients or it may be easier to gather the patients in one place? So this organization, by bringing together patients and creating a database, a way of accessing a group of patients at need, both in the United States but also worldwide in places where the available therapies may be less available. A group like this can push innovation in your disease just by existing. And so I wanted to share that. And I'll share that I, um, I'm a rheumatologist. I'm working for a company that is developing a complement inhibitor. And so I know firsthand, first, how passionate I am about trying to care for patients who have the diseases where I have lost um, patients in the past, and also the challenge of getting enough of those together to be able to rationally convince a company or be a company that can work in that field. So a, a group like this um, can be the incentive for a company coming to you and bringing, and bringing their possibilities into this area. Thank you.